Okay, recording in progress, here we go. So I'm going to share my web browser and I'm going to go into, are you thinking? Okay, and present. Okay, so welcome to Rethinking Student Instruction in Guided Pathways. And this is the first webinar, it's an overview. Um, I wanted to point out this slide deck is openly licensed and it's with a CC BY license so you can share, modify, and use this slide deck at will. I would be incredibly flattered and honored if you did choose to use it. Um, and I'll put a more formal license in there. This is kind of my placeholder, but I just wanted to start by saying um, if you find anything useful, please use it. Um, and I've also included a short URL to this slide deck. Um, so, my name is John Wetham. I am the program administrator for faculty development at the State Board, and I am in the assessment, teaching, and learning department. Um, and this is a not super great formatted picture of my supervisor, Bill Moore, who's our director, um, and Jackie Epler Clark, our exceptional educational specialist. And then there's me when I had longer hair. So I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about this webinar series um, and talk a little bit about why I wanted to offer this webinar series. So the ATL has an initiative around supporting faculty engagement in guided pathways. And if you wanna read more about that, there's a link to it um, in, the, in the slide deck so you can read a little bit more about that initiative. But one of the things that we really wanted to do in fall 2019 was conduct a landscape analysis and a needs assessment. So I created a very brief faculty survey that asked faculty two questions. Um, one, what, um, what do you think is the biggest problem, uh, concern, issue? that might hinder faculty engagement in guided pathways? And also what kinds of professional learning would you like? So we've had 434 responses to date and Bill Moore, my supervisor, uh, did a qualitative analysis of that data. And so you can see the, um, uh, so anyway, so he, he, it's almost ready for prime time, the qualitative analysis, but he used um, some analysis software. Um, if you would like to play in that data or with that data, we are going to be focusing a lot of time and attention at the assessment, teaching and learning winter retreat. Um, that's in, Rain it's at Rainbow Lodge in North Bend. It's March 26th and 27th. Um, we moved the dates because there was a conflict with ATD in previous years and unfortunately, we moved it and it now conflicts with the e-learning, the Canvas user group conference, the um, Washington, I can't remember, Alyssa, forgive me, it's the WAAC, I can't, it's WAC, WACC, yeah, no problem. <laughs> the WACC conference, so it conflicts with the WACC conference and it conflicts with um, a lot of colleges spring breaks, which I apologize for and that will not happen again. Um, but if you can make it, um, we are going to be, I've been working with uh, faculty leaders, leaders from the 12 early adopter colleges, and right now we're collaboratively determining the adaptive challenges to faculty leadership and engagement in guided pathways. And so we'll be sharing some of the some of those challenges, and then we'll be helping you do a mapping activity to create the bones of a strategic plan. Um, so that's just a little teaser for that event. And the um, the the survey data is complex and there were a lot of themes, but I, so I, I have the voices of, you know, over 400 people in my head a lot as I think about guided pathways. And there were just some really, you know, like a lot of people just wanna know like, what is guided pathways? And actually there were like at least eight responses that were just like, what is guided pathways? What is it? Um, I think there's definitely a theme around people just saying, you know, what are the reasons for doing this? And more importantly, you know, like even if we have good reasons, why are we why are we doing them? Why are we addressing it this way? Um, a lot of questions around the faculty role, how to foster faculty leadership and faculty voice in the work, um, how do we engage faculty in the work? 
Um, definitely a huge theme around uh, communicating effectively that people have felt like it's it's just all very vague and unclear. And I think too, a lot of questions about is guided pathways really about student learning? Um, does instruction play any kind of role or is it just student services and advising? So these are some of the, and again, we have um, a much more nicely presented document, but this is sort of my shorthand around what I, what's really been sticking in my head after spending a lot of time with that data as well. So I chose the webinar format because the modality provides a lot of access. Um, obviously, lots of people can log in from all over the state, all over the nation, all over the world. And again, I think Alyssa Sells, my e-learning twin um, at the State Board, does a really nice job of making sure that webinars are really interactive and that they're not just, you know, a 50-minute lecture. But sometimes you do need that direct instruction. Sometimes you really do need that delivering of content. And so, um, those of you who have presented with me know that when I do face-to-face -face events, I really struggle with the balance between um, how to create things that are more interactive and then also just my desire to just tell you all the things that I think about and all the things I know. So, um, so when, anyway, I guess I just thought this is a nice way to just deliver some content and it can be recorded so lots of people can listen on their own time. And um, and I think there is a need for high quality content around instruction in guided pathways because it's very sophisticated and it's very complex and people are busy. So there's lots of literature out there, um, but reading alone is different than when you're listening to someone else in community. And I'm just going to stop for a moment and just say, Hear some background noise, and so I'm just going to return to, um, if you are not muted, if you could mute yourself, um, and I'm just going to quickly mute all again. So, um, and Alyssa, do you, could you do me a favor? Could you just be monitoring the chat for me and just pause yeah, me just if, pause there's if there's anything? Um, sure, I got just a little bit sure, of feedback on your mic just now. I don't know what changed the, the feedback. Um, feedback. I'm hearing an echo of my own voice, actually, own too. Voice. Too. 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 It might be what you muted. I'm going to unmute. I'm going to unmute. Um, if you make me a co-presenter real quick. They are setting it up. We're not too late. Exactly the kind of <laughs> everyone can mute themselves. Oh, I did it yesterday. Thanks. Let me just check my everyone take a moment to mute. Okay, I'm gonna mute everybody again, so hopefully, we can still have the um. Okay, so sorry for the tech difficulties, everyone. I really apologize. Alyssa, um, I'm just trying to figure out how to make you a, a person. I'm just trying to figure out how <laughs> a to make person, you. A person, thank you. I'm trying um, to figure you out. You know what, I don't remember off the top of my head because I've been using Zoom, I think, more than WebEx. Yeah, um, just a second. Let me just make you a Alyssa and making you a Okay, I can't do it right now, but you can't you can't see the chat. No, I can see the chat. I just if if I was a co-host or a co whatever moderator with you, I'm able to help mute microphones and things. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, I'm just going to I'll I'm just going to go back to presenting and we'll yeah, You do that. Um, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. No worries, but I'll monitor the chat. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, um one of the reasons I also wanted to do a webinar is because I really love words and I really love ideas and I am a huge bookworm and I read a lot and I really, really miss the, those reading collectively moments from the classroom. I really miss the way that I read with students. Um, you know, and again, there's lots of, like those of you who are trained in reading apprenticeship know that as you are developing literacy skills, you are also really doing, you're also internalizing and grokking content in a way that's really unique and special. And so I'm really hoping that this webinar series can be a way to read collectively. And again, 
really hoping that that after this webinar series, you will want to go back and reread the sources that I'm quoting from. And again, I love slide decks. They remind me a lot of writing poetry. Um, I don't write poetry anymore, but I do make slide decks. So, um, and I can hear someone. Um, if so, if everyone could just make sure that they're muted, that would be great. Um, so I also um, do read feedback and I do try to improve. And so if you love the webinar series, if you hate it, um, if you're somewhere in between, please let me know um, because I really do want to give you good, high quality professional development. And so I have a, a form that I will paste into the chat for you um, in just a moment. So um, I know a lot of people have to leave early. I know some people can only be here for a limited time. And so I wanted to start with, um, there's been a couple requests in the survey for this webinar and in the survey um, in general, the faculty survey, people would love an elevator pitch for instruction in guided pathways. And so I respectfully um, give you this passage and this, um, when you look at the slide deck, this is 18 point font, so it's not accessible. Um, it's not, this is not a best practice in design. But in the guided pathways model, faculty define the skills, concepts, and habits of mind that students need to achieve by the end of their program and map out how students will build those learning outcomes across courses. The college emphasizes a learning facilitation approach to instruction which focuses on building students' academic motivation and metacognition. And the college systematically supports faculty in developing and improving this approach using a quote, collaborative inquiry framework. Instructors work closely with librarians, technologists, and student services professionals to design courses that incorporate innovative approaches to teaching and learning. Technology is recognized as a valuable tool for learning, but it is leveraged as part of a larger pedagogical toolkit and approach. Um, if we had more time, I would do a very formal rendering the text exercise. And it, what that rendering the text means, and there's a link to it in the slide deck if you want to use this at your college, is you identify a word, a phrase, or a sentence that really resonates with you. And so as you read through this, if you like, not, not mandatory, um, you can write down into the chat what word or phrase really resonates with you. Um, <clears throat> so essentially what this passage does is it, 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 it encapsulates the four approaches to instruction in a guided pathways redesign. And this is what chapter three in redesigning America's community colleges describes, these four approaches to instruction. And I'm deliberately repeating myself just to try to get this, just to help you sort of internalize some of this language because we learn by repetition. So, Again, the four approaches are emphasize skills, concepts, and habits of mind, peer-based professional development, collaborate with student services professionals, and leverage technology, technology wisely. Um, and so the rest of the webinars are designed around each of these four approaches that are outlined in chapter three. So you can see here, that the webinars are designed to unpack this elevator pitch or this proposed elevator pitch. So webinar two is Monday, January 13th at noon. Webinar three is Wednesday, January 22nd. Webinar four is Wednesday, January 29th. And webinar five is Friday, February 7th. Okay, so now we are going to officially begin webinar number one, and I can hear someone typing. And so, if everyone could just uh, just try, I've 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 muted everyone with my facilitator control, and I just don't think it's working. So, if everyone could just take one moment and um, 
mute themselves. And Alyssa, I'm just wondering before we officially begin, are, is there anything in the chat that I should know about or pay attention to? Um, I haven't seen anything come in. Just one question, how do we mute? And I can just go ahead and answer that. Um, in the participants panel, probably on the right side of your screen, just find your name and um, click your microphone icon. So that should um, mute or unmute you, depending on what you're trying to do. Thanks, Alyssa. Yep. Appreciate you. So um, I did have folks register for this webinar. And I really wanted to see the current level of guided pathway knowledge of about guided pathways so that I could try to design responsively. And as you can see, most of us feel like we're at a three in terms of knowledge about guided pathways. Um, so I just thought that was an interesting, um, I just, I, I like, I like stuff like this. <laughs> Um, and I also um, asked everyone to just say, what do you hope to know and be able to do after attending this webinar? And when I last checked it about an hour before the webinar, there were 137 responses. And I did include a link so that you can read the responses. And I sent that to all of you in an email and it's here on this slide deck. Um, but I just selected a few of them as kind of learning outcomes for what I hope to do today and throughout this webinar series. So you want to know, you want to have a better understanding of how GP works best for students. Love that one. More about guided pathways, what it means for faculty and students and how it will benefit learning. And I love that this person capitalized learning. Um, Amen. Discover how faculty can support and shape guided pathways toward a research-based initiative that supports student success. I thought that was just, I love those verbs of supporting and shaping. And uh, one person, I love this. I am a co-chair for a worker working on guided pathways. I am in how um, the state board is messaging the faculty role in this huge restructuring of our colleges. And I am too. Um, <laughs> I I sometimes forget that I, I I don't ever forget that I work at the state board. But I was thinking, yeah, I'm doing this webinar, and so um, so I, it just made me feel like the um, the the mantle of delivering the message. So uh, thank you for that. Um, thanks for that reminder. Um, I hope to learn about and then what people wanted to do with that information. I hope to learn about effective strategies for engaging faculty. I want to help my fellow faculty on my core team explain what roles we play, know what guided pathways is and how and there were a lot of people that this was a big theme in the um, in the survey data what people were really interested in how can I support faculty? How can I help faculty from my role? And there was a instructional designer and at least one faculty professional developer. Oops. Um, and I'm just going to stop for a moment and just say that I can hear some noise. And again, um, I'll just try again to mute you um, or to mute everybody. But if people could just make sure that they're muted and I apologize that um, the tech is not really cooperating with me today. So um, and then implemented guided pathways, but I find faculty are un unclear about their role as related to instruction. Our campus has mostly focused on the faculty advising role. So really, how do we further engage faculty? How do we further clarify their role? And there were tons of other beautiful responses. Um, and so I, I really spent a lot of time collating them and organizing them into themes. Um, so because again, like, I just really want to be a good professional developer and very carefully about how I can provide um, instruction that, or support that really helps all of us. Okay, so now I'm going to move into the direct instruction part. <laughs> and there are four design pillars for guided pathways. And I'm sure that if we were in a face-to-face -face audience, I would say, how many of you have heard of the four design pillars? And you'd all raise your hands and maybe we'd do some sort of like, um, you know, we do some sort of like standing up to show like how how familiar you are with these pillars. Um, and so I'm just going to spend a few minutes going over what they are. 
And I do want to say that there are four instructional approaches recommended by the authors of redesigning that we're going to unpack in this webinar series. And there are four design pillars that were later that, um, you know, early on, these were created by the American Association of Community Colleges. And so I know that's confusing. There's four instructional approaches, there's four design pillars, there's four of everything. But I do think that the four design pillars are really useful. And again, this is my best thinking about how to explain the four. So the first is clarify the path for students. And in this, faculty map out academic programs to create, quote, educationally coherent pathways. We're going to touch on what educational coherence, educationally coherent and incoherent means, but we're going to do a deeper dive into that in webinar two when we talk about metacognitive skills, concepts, and habits of mind. And each pathway has clearly defined learning outcomes that build across the curriculum and that align with requirements for further education and career advancement. And again, we're going to touch on this today, um, but we're really going to do the deep dive in the next webinar. Um, get students on the path. Uh, students are guided to choose a pathway, and this is based on interest in a discipline or field of study. So. Um, I remember when Jan Yoshiwara, our executive director, was talking about guided pathways really early on. She was like, um, you know, if a student comes to you and they don't know what they want to do with the next, you know, 10 years of their life or so, then what are they interested in? And a student might say, oh, well, I've always liked art. You know, I've always liked psychology. I've always been interested in sociology. I think there's tons of uh, little kids. I, I'm, I'm not making this up. I really think a lot of people would love to be an anthropologist if they weren't talked out about it, talked out of it, because I know that when I was growing up, I was like, Dad, I want to be an I want to be an anthropologist. And he was like, there's no money in that. So in this model, I could say, I want I love anthropology or I think I might be interested in anthropology. Um, and then be directed towards a pathway. Um, and then career aspirations. We do have a lot of students who come to us and say, I want to be a respiratory, I, I can't, it's great that I can say it. I want to be a respiratory therapist, or I want to be an educator, or I want to be um, whatever the field is. So again, um, I, I think the way that guided pathways sometimes gets shorthanded is it has to be about like know your career and the way that I've always heard it explained is not that's not the case. It can just be interest in a discipline or a field of study. Um, the next uh, pillar is keeping students on the path. And this is really getting specific about instructional and non instructional supports and um, this is the Gen version of, of design principle number three. And for those of you who know me, you know that I really care passionately about the transparency in learning and teaching project. So tilt higher ed, transparent assignment design. And one of the things that I really like about tilt is that it's really based in the three most important predictors of student success. And these are robustly proven with a plethora of research. Um, the first one is academic confidence. The second is sense of belonging. And the third is sense of gaining employer valued skills. So if we dig into the research about what makes students succeed in terms of short term retention, long term retention, completion of courses, completion of degrees, it's these three things. And I, I think the other key word to understand is that there's instructional supports like writing centers, math labs, um, like, like there's a plethora of instructional supports that you could use in your guided pathways redesign. And there's non instructional supports, um, food assistance, um, like, and again, the workforce folks and the adult basic education folks are really experts and student services are experts on non instructional supports. And so, again, um, how do how do you really support students once they're on that path in terms of instruction and non instruction? So. I wanted to pause for a moment and do a little bit of a deeper dive into the three most important predictors of student success. And if you look at this slide deck, you'll see in the notes that I've given Martin Cockroft um, 
credit for this. This is his uh, his slide that he's used with his faculty at Olympic. And I just think it's really beautiful. So academic confidence, I can learn math, sense of belonging. I'm supposed to be here. College is hard for everyone. My culture and my values are reflected here. Improved mastery of skills that employers value. What I'm learning will help me reach my long-term goals. So Martin, thank you so much for creating this beautiful slide that kind of unpacks these three predictors of success. And again, I think um, Guided Pathways is an invitation for us to think about how are we actively doing these three things with every interaction we have with our students. And this is also why um, I love tilt so much because pretty much any document can be tilted. And I'll just say that um, at the fall ATL retreat, Bruce Hattendorf, uh, when we were from Peninsula College, when we were talking about like what would be elevator pitches for guided pathways, he was like, guided pathways is tilt for the degree. Basically, how do you make your degree more transparent for students in these three ways? And then finally, the fourth design principle is ensure students are learning on the path. Jen, before you yeah. move on, sure. um, we have a comment in the chat, if you don't mind if I interrupt you. I'd love um, to be interrupted. Oh, I'm feeling okay. kind of solitary over here. All right, Carla was <laughs> asking about posting links to any research around three predictors of student success. Um, and then um, Dutch kindly replied, um, that the bibliography in redesigning America's community colleges is fabulous and has many useful resources. Do you have any other resources you would add to that? Or do you have a place where you're like accumulating those types of things that we could have access to later or that you could share out? I love this question. And I'm just wondering if you could send me a quick email and remind me to send everyone on the list um, the bibliography for Tilt. Uh, Marianne Winklemiss has all of the sources that she, the Marianne Winklemiss is the um, uh, principal investigating officer for Tilt Higher Ed, and so she has a very impressive bibliography about that research. And Dutch is right, the bibliography in redesigning is also, uh, the, in the book Redesigning America's Community Colleges is also robust. So I will send out that link, and I'll also add a link to the slide deck. Perfect. Thank you. Melissa, thanks. Um, are there any no other problem. questions in the chat or any other comments? We could stop for a moment and just see. Um, that's the only one that I saw. So um, I think you're good to go on unless anybody wants to ask another question now. Yeah, um, so I'll keep talking and then I'll just incur Thank you, Carla, for posting a question. And I'll just say, people, please feel free to post questions. And Alyssa, please pause me at any moment. Press pause and and, ha and have me uh, stop at any moment. Okay, so ensure students are learning on the path is the fourth design principle. And, um, they, and, and really Guided Pathways um, is asking us to move to what's called a learning facilitation model. And again, I'm not going to have time today's in today's webinar to unpack what that means. We're really going to unpack that in the next webinar. What is a learning facilitation model? Um, and then each course a student takes is, a con is conceptualized by faculty, by the college, by everyone as a step along a coherent path. And again, instruction is really focusing on building the skills, concepts, and habits of mind necessary for success. This is an important one in subsequent courses. And students' interest and excitement about learning should be stimulated in their early coursework and reinforced and sustained in subsequent courses. And again, um, we'll be doing a much deeper dive into what this means um, in the next webinar. So I wanted to say really quickly that I think one of the things that's sort of confusing about Guided Pathways or where I think there is a lot of confusion like a path to what, a path to where. And really, if you ha the, the pathway is to post-secondary credentials. And um, I've been getting a lot of feedback about the um, bureaucratic language of the Guided Pathways redesign, which I think is really helpful. And so I wanted to pause and just unpack this bureaucratic mouthful. So 
post, and, and again, I apologize um, if this feels uh, like I'm dumbing it down in any way, but post-secondary education is provided by colleges, universities, and technical institutes. And an individual's post-secondary education is represented by what we call credentials and or in higher ed speak they call them credentials and it's an umbrella term for a variety of different degrees so there's the AA there's the AAS there's the BA there's the BAS there's the MA there's the PhD uh, is getting um, a master's in psychology right now and he wants to be licensed clinical um, he wants to work with patients, and so he has been really struggling with, like, what's the right credential? Is it a master's? Is it a, um, like, there's there's so many different terms in psychology for practicing uh, therapists. So, again, like, this is something I've been watching him do is he uh, bounds through, like, hundreds of <laughs> websites to try to figure out, like, what credential will let me do the job I want to do. So a credential signifies the level of knowledge, skills, and experience of a graduate. And there's lots of ways to talk about why credentials are important. Um, but I chose this, um, this data from the Bureau, Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, median weekly earnings in 2017 for those with the highest levels of educational attainment, so doctoral and professional degrees, were more than triple those um, with the lowest level, which is less than a high school diploma. Workers with at least a bachelor's degree earned more than $907, uh, more than the 907 median weekly earnings for all workers. And also the higher the level of education, the lower the unemployment rate. Now, again, I could have given you a lot of different data from a lot of different sources to talk about why credentials are important, but there's one comment from the survey that's in my head where somebody said, you know, like, why are we doing pathways when we can't predict what students will be doing even two years from now. Like we can't predict what kinds of jobs will be available. We can't predict the labor economy. Most of our graduates will have like six different jobs in different industries. So why are we focusing so much on career? And I, I, I would just argue that we're not focusing necessarily on careers as much as we're focusing on credentials of getting that high, getting people the highest level of credential they possibly you know that translates in no matter what your field, that higher uh, income. And we're, I'm not saying that we need people with higher incomes so that they can all become, you know, like, I, I don't I, I don't even know how to talk about it except to say that for a lot of our students and for a lot of people in Washington state, they do not earn a living wage. They can't even afford to work because they can't afford child care. There's so they can't volunteer their time. Um, they can't buy healthy food because they don't have a living wage. And that's really and again, this is the John Wetham version of it. But this is really what this is about is about equipping people with credentials so that they can enter the workforce in ways that will help them pursue the kinds of lives that they would like to live with their families. So. Um, Jen, we do have a question uh, sure. from Bob. It says hey, Bob. in Guided Pathways, credential is defined as degree question mark or could also be um, a certificate of completion or an STTC question mark. So, Bob, that is a great question, and I'm going to ask you if I could cover that in a moment because I actually have a slide about that. Um, so is it okay if I answer that in a moment? There's a slide. There's a slide for that. <laughs> um, and thanks for asking that. Thank you for asking that question. So, GP Guided Pathways in general is asking us to put our collective attention on four credit programs that lead to post-secondary credentials. This is not to say that we don't have non-credit programs. This is not to say that we don't have other kinds of credentials, but again, it's really about four credit programs leading to post-secondary credentials. So, in, um, 
So Guided Pathways um, is asking us to look at two key areas in terms of that. Um, sorry, I just want to say one thing really quickly. So I am actually doing this webinar from my parents' house because um, my my internet is out today, like conveniently out on the day that I am hosting a webinar for 179 people that will be recorded. And my mom just asked me if I wanted a cup of tea. So I said yes. So anyway, so I just wanted to give you, if anyone was noticing a weird thing with silence, it was because my mom dropped me a note to ask if I wanted a cup of tea. Okay, so in two key areas, which is transfer and occupational. So two areas. So transfer is to prepare transfer to bachelor's degree programs, so essentially the Associates of Arts, the Associate of Science. And in occupational, it's to prepare students for direct entry into jobs, so occupational certificates and applied associate programs. And so, Bob, your question is yes. It's, um, it's really thinking about preparing students for direct entry into jobs and the credential they need for that job. Um, and this is where this, the nuance around the question you asked is out of my scope of expertise, but I know that um, what our researchers at the state board have found, David Prince has found, and researchers at the Community College Research Center is that we are, a lot of students from historically underserved populations are actually tracked into lower certificates, lower wage certificates, and they did a presentation on this the most recent Student Success Center Institute. And so if anyone's interested in um, seeing that slide deck, there's also a data set that all colleges have access to from CCRC. So you can actually look and see how are students, um, what kinds of certificates and what kinds of degrees are your students getting? And then you can look and see if, um, for example, if um, students of color are being um, directed into lower wage uh, certificates. So again, this is, and, and this is, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself because we're gonna talk about equity-minded praxis in a moment. But I am just gonna pause for one moment and just say, Robert, did that, and Bob, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Oh, cool, okay, good, good. Um, I want to go back to this for a minute and say, prepare students for transfer, prepare students for direct entry into jobs. And I feel like a lot of us would say, isn't that what we're doing? And I'll just stop for a moment and just ask if, um, if people feel like that. Do people feel like, hey, that's what, hey, that's what we're already doing. I'm preparing students for transfer. I'm preparing students for jobs. How would you like people to indicate their agreement? Oh, oh. Uh, they could they um, put it in the chat? Yeah. I think I think for a lot of us, I, I, and again, when I was typing this slide deck, I was thinking about my own experience teaching English, English 101. I was like, of course I'm teaching students for transfer, like, because they have to write papers and they'll have to write in their job. And of course, I'm teaching students for work because, you know, workplace writing is so important. Um, so I, I guess I, I just, the reason I, I wrote this is because I wanted to honor that this is what we're doing already. And Guided Pathways is asking us to make two really big shifts in how we are doing that work of preparing students for transfer and preparing students for work. So one is what I'm calling equity-minded praxis, and one is what the authors call focus on programs, not courses. So equity-minded prax praxis. Um, I wanted to start with a definition of the term equity-mindedness, and this is from the Center for Urban Education. And it is the perspective or mode of thinking exhibited by practitioners who call attention to These practitioners are willing 
to take personal and institutional responsibility for the success of their students and critically reassess their own practices. It also requires that practitioners are race conscious and aware of the social and historical context of exclusionary practices in American education. And again, um, I, I actually, I wanted to go back for a moment. Equity-minded praxis is actually a term that the state board is using in our description of guided pathways. And so I wanted to stop and slow down for a minute and just explain what that is. Um, and then the definition of the term praxis. So Dr. Deborah Jenkins of Clark College, uh, th this is me paraphrasing her, praxis is the intersection between theory and practice. And Friere defines praxis in pedagogy of the oppressed as reflection and action directed at the structures to be transformed. And I, I like that reflection and action directed at the structures to be transformed. So with that in mind, one way to talk about the big problem that Guided Pathways is trying to solve is that open access to courses in organizations of higher education does not equal equity of program completion. And we're gonna talk about that today in a lot more detail because there's a lot to unpack um, in this statement. So this is from the authors of Redesigning America's Community Colleges where they say, our argument can be simply stated. And again, for the people who asked me for elevator pitches, like I was totally thinking of you the whole time, like I'm really trying to find you elevator pitches. Community colleges were designed to expand college enrollments. And they talk a lot about what that means and why they think that um, <laughs> in the book, but essentially community colleges of a historical era were designed to expand enrollments, particularly among underrepresented students, and to do this at a low cost. They have been extraordinarily successful in achieving those goals. However, colleges designed to maximize course enrollment are not well designed to maximize completion of high quality programs of study. And again, we'll be talking a little bit more about what we mean by a focus on courses. But again, I, you know, when you think about the way that we have conversations around enrollment, it's always about course enroll, well, it's not always, but course enrollments are a big deal to us in higher education in community in open access community colleges we make a lot of decisions around course enrollments um i wanted to take a minute to un unpack the term under um i do prefer for equity work um two terms coined by dr deborah jenkins of share the flame and also of clark college um systemically dominant and systemically non-dominant populations. And if you're interested in reading more about what those terms mean and why they're more precise for equity work, I've included a link to her um, explanation. But for this presentation, I am going to use the language of research, the language of data, the language of policy research, which is historically underserved students of color and this is students identifying as American Indian, Alaska Native, Black, African American, Hispanic Latino, or Native Hawaiian, or other Pacific Islander. And again, I, I want to be really clear that we are really narrowing in on this is the population we want to serve better. This is our focus. And I have more words about that in a moment. Before we do that, I'd like to do some equity-minded praxis. And specifically, I want to show you some patterns of inequity in outcomes for historically underserved students in Washington State and in our Washington State CTCs. So the source for this data is from a state board research brief prepared by my colleague, Devin Dupree. Uh, why focus on equity? And he presented this to faculty who were working on the transparency and learning and teaching 
project. So the first thing that I wanted to show you are gaps in college attainment for 25 to 44 year olds in Washington State. So you can see here that non-historically underserved populations, five out of 10 have a college degree, two have some college and three have no college. So you can look here and you can see that for historically underserved populations, two out of 10 have a college degree, three have some college and five have no college. And again, this is a word version of the data. And if you click on the links included in the slide deck, you'll be able to see some really nice graphics around this. But I am not a visual person. I am a word person. And, so, and also, it, 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 I just wanted to show it to you this way. Um, in terms of these indicators of our Washington State community colleges, historically underserved students of color were less likely leave our community and technical colleges in Washington State with a post-secondary credential. So again, you can see the gap here that for non-historically underserved populations, 37% leave with a post-secondary credential, and for our historically underserved populations, 29%. Um, in terms of earning outcomes, you can see that historically underserved students of color who did not leave with a post-secondary credential or transfer who started a job with a salary of at least 30,000 a year. So, oh, um, oh, so you can see that, actually, I think my data, I'm so sorry about this. I was moving between slide decks. Okay, so this is, this is the correct number. So for non-historically underserved populations, it's 14%, and for historically underserved populations, it's 14%. So there isn't a gap there. Um, in terms of transfer, historically underserved students of color were less likely to transfer or your university institution without a post-secondary credential. So again, there's a gap there, 12% to 10%. But here's the one that I, this is the one that I think is really compelling. So in terms of the historically underserved students of color who did not leave with a post-secondary credential, they did not transfer and they did not start a job with a salary of at least 30,000. So for non-historically underserved populations, that's 47%. For historically underserved populations, that's 37%. And actually, I'm just gonna check my data here because I think I got those numbers mixed up and I really apologize. I, I spent a lot of time on this slide deck, but you know, sometimes you get so close to something that you can't um, look at it well. So, so um, I hope that you, I think you can see this, gaps in student outcomes in the year. So the students who, um, so again, there's a 10% gap here um, between historically underserved students of color and other students, a 10% gap with, with all three of those outcome indicators. And that is, um, this is really what we wanna focus on. And Alyssa, did you want, is there any comments? Yep. Yep, sorry, I was just about no, to interrupt you, but you, you, were, you were keeping going, so I was going to wait a second. Um, no, no, that's great. There is a question from Jeanette in the chat, and she's asking, did the last statistic about credentials also address types of creden credentials like certificates versus um, AAs? But I'm not sure which slide she was asking about. I think she's asking about um, leave it, this, one. this one, leave with a post-secondary credential. And again, slide, she says, yeah, again, there's, um, I'll just look for a moment at the handout just to see. Um, I, but again, like our researchers would be able to answer the question around the deep dive in terms of what kinds, but I'm pretty sure for post-second, a broad umbrella term. Um, so Alyssa, I'm just wondering in your list of Jen's things to do, could you make a note that I will check with our researchers about a precise and accurate answer to that question? Sure, and um, to add to that list, um, maybe we could just share out that entire document. Yes, yes, it's 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 in the slide deck. Um, okay, so when perfect. it's on the slide yeah, deck, everybody right will have access okay. to it. Okay, so I wanted to use this moment to talk about the state board vision statement. And this June, um, the governor appointed Washington State Board, which is nine members of the state board, um, and, and again, these are the governor appointed. This is the board of the board. I work for the agency, <laughs> the 183 member staff agency <laughs> who's not appointed by the governor. Um, 
But this is what our board, the state board, unanimously approved as a vision statement. Leading with racial equity, our colleges maximize student potential and transform lives within a culture of belonging that advances racial, social, and economic justice in service to our diverse communities. And I, I, I this is, um, there, I've, I've included a link to a document that explains our vision in more uh, detail, but I love this language and so I put it in the slide deck. I didn't write this, I wish I had. The vision statement is meant to inspire us, to challenge us, and to capture the heart of our mission so well that we are restless to improve. It also helps, it also answers a fundamental question. What do we hope to achieve for our students and the world they create? So again, when we talk about leading with racial equity and we talk about equity-minded praxis, this is really, this work of Guided Pathways is really about looking at our institutions to see what is in our control to transform. I wrote this, um, so grain of salt here, but the skewed and inequitable outcomes for historically underserved students show us that mere access to higher education does not result in equity. There is so much within our control to transform. The primary purpose of Guided Pathways in Washington State is to redesign our institutions with equity in mind so that we are continuously looking for I remove and I removing barriers that recreate opportunity gaps. And our primary goal is to eliminate equity gaps. If I had more time, I would talk about opportunity gaps. I would do a deep dive into opportunity gaps and I would use Richard Milner's Beyond a Test Score, um, which talks about how mindsets of educators can lead to practices that actually either create or recreate opportunity gaps. But we don't have time, um, and I'm just gonna look, I'm gonna use that as a reminder for the time. Um, and if we had even more time, I would do a deep dive into Estella Mara Bensimmon's argument that we have long explained away equity gaps by thinking about them as student learning problems. But really what the data shows us, um, according to Bensimmon's argument, is that these are actually indicative of practitioner and institutional learning problems. And that's really what Guided Pathways is asking us to think about. Like rather than talking about student learning problems, what are we, what do we not know? What are we not doing? And we talk about um, the focus on courses, then that's where I think it starts to become clear. So, I'm gonna stop for a moment because it's three o'clock and I don't know how I my practice did not um, manage <laughs> for the, the high level of content, but um, I'm gonna pause for a moment and just ask for, um, before I move into a focus on programs, not courses, what are comments, what are questions, um, what's resonating with you? Um, Let's just maybe hear from a few, maybe people could type into the chat. Jen, do you need me to read the chat to you or can you see the chat from? Yeah, that would be awesome. I think I think also the other thing that I would love is to know, like I know a lot of people have to leave it at three and or after an hour, but I still have more content to go through, and I'm wondering how people would feel if I if I moved on to the to the focus on what it means to have a focus on programs rather than a focus on courses. If people could just kind of type into the chat, like, is it okay if I keep going? <laughs> So yes is coming in. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. Oops. Great. Okay. 
So um, here is sort of elevator pitch from the authors of Guided Pathways of Redesigning. Colleges need to engage faculty and student services professionals in creating more clearly structured, educationally coherent program pathways that lead to students' end goals. And in rethinking instruction and student support services in ways that facilitate students' learning and success as they progress along those paths. Um, and here's why I wanted to include this, this quote. In short, to maximize both access and success, a fundamental redesign is necessary. And, and I like that as an elevator pitch. Guided Pathways is about maximizing not, we already have access. What we don't really have, arguably, is success. So a fundamental redesign is necessary. So this leads us to a focus on programs and not courses. So before we continue, I, I do want to, I love this quote from Asao B. and Wei um, from Anti-Racist Writing Assessment Ecologies. And he says, I'm not interested in the exceptions, only the patterns. As a culture, we focus too much on exceptions, often believing ourselves into believing that because there are exceptions, the rule no longer exists or that it's easily broken by anyone with enough willpower or chutzpah. And the reason I wanted to include this quote is because I think as I talk about as I talk about a focus on programs, not courses, obviously there are going to be places in our institutions which have a beautiful, rigorous example of a focus on programs. However, again, th this is more about looking at the broader pattern and the status quo of higher education at any university, not just to your open access colleges. So conceptual shift away from courses towards programs. Um, and the authors argue that the status quo focuses on courses rather than programs. So one way that they talk about this, in both transfer and occupational programs, course learning outcomes are not always tied to program learning outcomes. And what they mean by that is not just on my syllabus, I have program learning outcomes, or on my assignment, I'm mapping things up to program learning outcomes. What they're talking about here is that I take the first course and I get my first foundational set of skills. I take my second set of courses and I'm building on those skills. I take my third set of courses, my third quarter, and I'm building even more. So it's really more about what happens along the path of the program and not so much about the learning that happens in the individual course. As a result, students end up taking courses merely to meet program requirements, checking off boxes, rather than mastering skills and knowledge relevant to their goals. And again, I feel sometimes a little bit inarticulate about how to explain the nuance here, um, but I did put together a couple different quotes. So Gerald Graff um, wrote an essay called It's Time to End Corsocentrism. And he wrote this a long time ago for humanities faculty. Um, he's an English professor. At a time when we are more aware of the social and collective nature of intellectual work, we still think of teaching in ways that are narrowly private and individualistic, as something we do in isolated classrooms with little or no knowledge of what our colleagues are doing in the next classroom or the next building and little chance for each other's courses to become reference points in our own. Indeed, we betray our assumption that teaching is by nature a slow act in our unreflecting use of the classroom as shorthand for all teaching and learning, as if the way we teach now were reducible to the way I teach now. I think Graf is a fine writer. And I, I think there's some interesting points to kind of unpack that we do approach teaching generally as something that I do in my classroom, rather than thinking about teaching as something that we do in our program. And I didn't, I didn't have time to find the quote, but he talks about the difference between, you know, like if you are an individual soloist, 
or part of an orchestra. And so just for a moment, if you could imagine, you know, like an orchestra, if every single person in the orchestra is playing their own song and no one's coordinated what song they're playing with anyone else, that's what they mean in guided pathways by instructional incoherence. That's what they mean by a focus on courses rather than a focus on the program. So the collective assumption of the status quo in higher education is that if we all teach our courses conscientiously, each of us making sure our demands are as clear and transparent as possible, our students will make coherent sense of our diverse pers perspectives and will eventually be socialized into our intellectual community. And I do want to say that I understand completely that this is much more directed at academic transfer. And again, I want to point out that the context he's writing is for people who teach in the humanities. So he has some pretty snarky examples of like the disconnect that can happen in terms of diverse perspectives, like even among English composition. Um, but again, I think there's a larger point here that assumption that if I do a good job teaching my class and Alyssa does a really great job teaching of her class and Justin does a really great job teaching his class, then we don't need to be on the same. That that somehow the students will end up having a coherent experience. But what we actually know or what, what I think Guided Pathways is asking us to really consider and take this seriously that students are getting what, what Gerald Graff calls a mixed message curriculum. Because the problem is that no matter how transparent your course is, as long as we don't know a lot about what's happening in other people's courses, um, students will come away with really mixed messages. And there's, um, as the educational thinker Joseph Tessman once put it, all the courses in the program may be admirably coherent, but a collection of simply be an incoherent collection. And, and so again, from a lens of inquiry, once you build the meta major, once you create the program map, it becomes about what do students need in terms of skills and competencies to be ready for junior level status to, of transfer and or workforce readiness if they're on the occupational side? And then how are you making sure that after each course, a student can say, okay, I've met the course outcomes and this is how it's contributing to the big picture of readiness for me. So, the way that they talk about it in redesigning is allowing students, I love this, allowing, I love this for the language, allowing students to cobble together their own programs from a wide menu of courses may limit student learning. A large body of research shows that new knowledge is gained by connecting it to previous knowledge. There is a lot more here um, in the chapter about what they mean by um, what this research shows. But I think the big takeaway here is that if a student, that, that, that oftentimes what students really need for mastery is continued practice and it needs to be in a very structured sort of way. So for example, with writing, we know that um, a student isn't going to learn everything they need in English 101 in 10 weeks. They're just not going to get that. And so how do you make what happens in English 101 a foundation for what happens in future coursework? And then, so that does require a lot of alignment in between courses. It requires a lot of intentionality about orchestra model. How do, like, if you think about it as the student's experience at a symphony or at a concert, um, how are you structuring and scaffolding that so that you're really deepening their learning over time? Um, and I feel like I'm not explaining this super well. Um, <laughs> so I'll just say, I'll let the authors say it. If the students are to achieve meaningful learning outcomes and associated skills in a program, they need to develop that knowledge and skills systematically and cumul cumulatively over time, not in a haphazard fashion. 
It's difficult to see how a college program could help students learn effectively without establishing clear learning goals that are interconnected across courses in a program. And this is, again, this is one of the invitations of guided paths. over time and not haphazardly because if you do give students a huge individual courses and let them sort of develop their own programs you can't guarantee that they're going to get knowledge and skills systematically and cumulatively not in the focused way that junior level status requires um, and i didn't have time to put this in the slide deck but there's an example of University of Arizona in uh, redesigning, where they talk about how before guided pathways, students from Maricopa Community College had transfer status, but they didn't have major status. They didn't have major readiness status. So they worked out maps. I think they called them maps like M-A-P-P-S maps with University of Arizona between Maricopa and University of Arizona so that students knew with each course, okay, I'm this much closer to junior level status in my major. And the authors describe that very compellingly. So, I think um, it is now 3.09, and what I'd like to do in webinar two is talk more about um, what it means to have a focus on a program by talking about the key shifts of a guided pathways redesign. So one of them is moving away, uh, is moving towards a learning facilitation approach, um, really focusing on building students' academic motivation and metacognition. So we'll be doing a deeper dive into how this um, curricular incoherence, how this Corso-centric model, how this mixed message curriculum actually is really not motivating for students. And it actually makes giving them metacognitive skills very, very difficult because nobody's it's no one's job to do it so then either some people are doing all of it or so you know so again we'll be we'll just be doing a deeper dive into a lot of this uh content so with that oh and i also wanted to ask you too sorry i want to have one more slide um if you are interested in a different kind of learning experience the atl retreat will be very immersive very interactive um, not a lot of like lecture um, and then the spring assessment teaching and learning conference um, again will be a chance to really learn from other people about what they're doing in their classrooms and i'm sending out the call for proposals next week so i hope that you'll put these two um, events on your calendar as more professional development around these topics and issues because again my office is very concerned with providing high quality professional development around faculty engagement and faculty leadership so with that, I am going to go back to my, uh, WebEx, and I'm just going to ask what are people thinking and feeling? What questions do people have? What, um, what comments do people have? What are people thinking? Actually, I'm seeing that people are writing things in the chat, which makes me so happy. Um, Alyssa, as you've been monitoring the chat, what are you thinking about? Um, do, what, what do you think need, should be highlighted? Thanks for putting me on the spot, Jen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm still a little just overwhelmed with everything. My understanding of um, guided pathways is very limited, which is one of the reasons why I'm coming to all of your webinars. Um, so actually, I, 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 I found my footing. I found my footing. This is perfect. OK, so from Olympic College at 308, a faculty member wrote, cobbling together my own program didn't learn, limit my learning. It deepened my learning, including taking an opera class as a math major. How to reconcile this perspective with what the authors of redesigning are saying? And I see that Jen Kelly responded and said, perhaps you might not be in the systematically non-dominant population. Um, and I just, sorry, it just kind of went a little bit crazy. Um, my, my screen, I just lost my screen. 
shoot, John Kelly, you were saying a smart thing. Uh, you, perhaps you might not be in the systematically non-dominant population that GP attempts to provide for. Um, in other words, perhaps cobbling works for some, but not all. I knew it worked for me, but I had a lot of opportunities and privilege as well. Um, um, and then a faculty member follow up. How does restructuring address the equity issue? Not seeing the connection. So I, I would really love to just take a moment and pause and just say the 1st thing. That people are having this robust conversation and I'm, I just want to honor the question and the feedback, the comment in response. And I guess what I would say about this is that again, we're not talking about the exceptions here. We're talking about the larger patterns and we are particularly talking about. Students who have experienced major, major opportunity gaps. Um, as a result of being in a lower socioeconomic income bracket, um, experiencing systemic racism in the form of um, like, and, and again, this is where I think a deeper dive into Milner and a deeper dive into Benseman is helpful. Um, and also the article from Gerald Graff also talks a lot about why um, yes, you're right. For some students, this does work. For some students, they thrive in the chaos of a mixed message curriculum, and they do have the metacognitive skills, concepts, and habits of mind to succeed in a, to make coherence out of incoherence. And so I think it's really, really important to know that we're talking about the large numbers of students who are not getting credentials. We're talking about the large number of students who leave because the incoherence is just too much for them. And I feel like I'm not saying this super articulately, but I would ask that um, if you're interested in um, why, like the, like reading Gerald Graff, I think is a really interesting, um, Reading Gerald Graff is a really interesting way to talk about this. So um, I'm just looking in the chat about um, what else is happening. What else is happening? Um, uh, there's a quote from uh, Dutch about Dutch Henry from Shoreline. We have to see our students and their experiences rather than our own. Um, Dutch, that's really beautiful. Um, thank you so much for that comment. And yes, you're absolutely correct. Um, and Dutch also wrote, one of the challenges we face is that we succeeded in a system that doesn't work for most students. And Dutch, that's absolutely correct. Um, so, oh, and I guess I wanted to just say one more thing to the faculty who wrote, how does restructuring address the equity issue, not seeing the connection? So one of the things that's really important is that every college is looking at its own data with equity in mind. And that you're thinking about where are the barriers that, it, where are the barriers in our structures and our systems? That are um, that are that are creating these gaps. So again, it's really about it's a very individual thing in terms of the institution because each student, each 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 campus's demographic is so radically different from each other that what equity what the restructuring will look like on your campus will really depend on your equity gaps and how thoughtfully everyone looks at those gaps with an, with an eye towards what are the practitioner learning things here what are the institutional learning things here and also what are the barriers that maybe we're not right we're not aware of right now um so from uh, T. Wright, he asked, we are wondering how prerequisite fit to program outcomes. And I, I guess um, one thing I'm wondering, uh, uh, Tim, I think it's Tim. Um, can you just yeah. clarify? Yeah, go ahead. Can you just clarify that question a little bit? Yeah, that actually came from uh, my colleague here. Um, Kyle, you want to clarify? We were talking about um, The idea here is, is essentially if 
by having set prerequisites, we essentially do create this path for them uh, through a program. I would so there's a whole chapter in redesigning America's community colleges around like and I guess I, I just want to be clear that prereqs are more like do you have college readiness by taking English 101 so that you can take SOCH 100 is that that's what you're talking about you're not talking about like the dev ed math sequence is that correct it's more uh, for me it's business and we, the way we set ours up we want to get as many have prereqs like business 101 should be a prereq for science education and that's not we were trying to just go classes and not worry about learning i guess and so i when we were talking about the equity in that it made me think that we should add prereqs so one thing about about the prereqs is that um like prereqs i think are 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 sort of an add-on to what when, when we don't have pathways for students prereqs are sort of how we try to prereqs are sort of our shorthand our institutional shorthand because a lot of times prereqs are actually barriers um, like if a student is really interested in sociology and they have to take English 101 first and the English 101 isn't connected to the sociology, then the, then the course might not be as meaningful for them. Um, so I think part of, part of the reason that they're calling so hard for the program maps and for the, for the coherence model is because then everything can be contextualized and, and again, strategically developed. So because you're in business, you actually might have more of a pathway than you think. Does that make sense? Like I think some, some programs, some, some departments are more programmatic than others, like business, for example. Like, so again, I think for you, it might be more uh, tweaking to the pathway um, to say like, these are, so, but rather than calling them prereqs, you're just outlining like, okay, they're gonna, the students will take this contextualized English 101 their first quarter. So they learn the principles of business writing. And while they're also taking this uh, math one, I can't, I don't know what the math is for your pathway, but they're okay. also- It's less about the math and English. I love this example and I, I love this imagining around it. And thank you. Thank you for that example. I, now, now I'm thinking about like the business, like, yes, exactly, exactly right. That's, that's exactly what I think they're talking about is, yeah, if, if you know that it's better for a student to take a certain course at a certain time, ha, you know, schedule it that way in the, in the maps. Um, so I, I'm just looking through the, um, uh, so, so there was another comment from Olympic. Uh, can you point us to evidence that it is the incoherence that isn't working for them rather than other factors? And this is a great, great point and i just want to acknowledge that for this slide deck i purposely focused on the incoherence because that's the thing that's within the faculty control um, there are in the chapter they also describe a multitude of other factors that aren't working um, for students with our status quo and so the the incoherence is only one sub point of a lot of other points so um, whoever said that at Olympic, fair point. Um, I, I can point you to evidence that incoherence isn't working, <laughs> but there are lots of other factors that are also not working. So it's not just the incoherence. Um, so you're absolutely right. Um, so thank you. Um, Jeanette Sanchez wrote, maybe it would help to think about the sense of belonging portion. When a student doesn't feel comfortable in our system because they are new to it, they aren't going to necessarily feel comfortable cobbling a program. Oh, so true. And I love that you use the verb cobble. Thank you. They might not feel able to add an opera class because they have been told that arts won't contribute to STEM study. Jeanette, Jeanette, that's a beautiful point. And um, 
you're absolutely correct. And and also this is also um, in a pathway, an exciting thing to consider. You know, how might opera contribute to STEM? And could you could you could you build that kind of experience in for a student? Um, oh, and Jeanette wrote, uh, music is math. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'm just looking in the chat to see if I missed anything. Um, I do wanna say thank you to um, the faculty member from Olympic who's asking these questions because something that, um, Something that I've been really concerned about because Martin Cockroft phrased it so beautifully. How do we create space for this kind of dialogue and this kind of discussion beyond hallway conversations? Um, so faculty member from Olympic, thank you. And if you have few further comments or questions, please raise them because um, this is one space that I hope to do this. Um, Anne, uh, Anne wrote from uh, uh, Cascadia, I appreciate knowing the clear goal of, um, let's see, sorry. Um, I just lost it. It's, it. There's something kind of jumpy about my mouse, I guess. Um, so Anne, where is your comment? Let's see. I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'll, I'll keep uh, scrolling down to see if I can, what, what else shows up in the chat. So, um, let's see. Oh my goodness. Oh, oh my goodness. Uh, Gloria wrote in the chat, I would be very interested in how guided pathways will assist those of us who teach in professional technical programs where students are aiming for credentials after graduation. Our programs are already per se guided pathways. Gloria, absolutely, yes. Because again, um, I think prof tech programs do a really great job of working with advisory boards. There's lots of different structures for um, professional technical pro um, programs to find out what do employers value and actively work with employers to really bridge effectively between what's happening in the program and then in course learning and what employers value. I think, um, the, the piece for professional technical programs is that I don't always know that direct, that the other principles of the pathway are, um, you know, because, because some of it is for the college to do. Um, and so I would, I would draw you back to the slides where I, where I kind of outline the, um, the elevator pitch of guided pathways in chapter three, where they talk about the college assisting faculty in um, in supporting inquiry around assessment of learning. And so I think there's there's still some things that there's still some guided pathways principles that I think are in, more institutional um, or around bridging with student services. And again, this isn't for all prof tech programs. I know some prof tech programs have a lot of support built in um, instructional supports built in and non-instructional supports, but it's really more about um, it's really more about this this institution for for guided for sorry I'm tired now and so <laughs> I'm ra I'm stuttering a little for professional technical programs there are other aspects of guided pathways that I think still relate and could and still could be improved um, and so but again it, it's going to look different at different programs um, I found Anne's comment I appreciate knowing the clear goals of guided pathways guide students to transfer or direct entry into jobs and the clear emphasis on historically underserved populations and racial equity. Knowing that's an emphasis and those are the goals are going to help faculty. And um, thank you so much for that comment. I really appreciate it. And let's see what else people wrote. Um, Bridget had a comment about backwards planning a whole program. And um, there's another comment from Olympic that was earlier, some conversation here about relationship between equity gaps 
and streamlining student credit degree acquisition because they can't afford to wander. Seems like a shift in the guided pathways focus. Um, I guess I am not I guess I'm not quite sure what this question is asking um, because I think what I was talking about with the relationship with equity gaps and guided pathways is I, I did not say anything about how they can't afford to wander. Um, and I guess I would just be, I would just ask that for those of you listening to this recording and for those of you who attended this webinar, I did not say anything about students can or not being able to afford to wander. Um, for me, this is much more about what do our outcomes show us about who we're serving and who we're not serving. And how do we approach this redesign to really think about the way that our structures, our institutional structures are not serving our most vulnerable populations. And also, and, and we'll go into this in a little bit of a deep, we'll go into this in a lot more of a deeper dive. But basically, in the next webinar, but basically the argument of chapter three is that due to opportunity gaps, students are not academically prepared for college. And so the status quo has developed a lot of workarounds for students who are not college ready. And so and, and again, like really looking at the student learning problem, like really, it's it's really asking us to take a different approach to student student readiness and how we shape instruction around readiness or not re or this this concept of ready and not ready. And again, it's a complicated conversation because there's a lot of deficit in the notion of students not being ready for college or, or quote unquote being ready for college. But given the opportunity gaps that many of our students from historically underserved populations suffer um, or experience, it's really asking us, are, are our institutions recreating opportunity gaps or are we trying to address those head on? And so that is, um, that's really important. Um, so I, I see another uh, note from Olympic. What we believe after listening to you is that our administration has not really presented guided pathways as you have today, but as a way to expedite students through their programs. We have received a very different message here <laughs> than you presented today, and we like yours much better. Well, thank you. Um, I have spent a lot of time sifting through the guided pathways literature for the last five years. And I, too, have not been happy with the way that sometimes Guided Pathways is messaged. And that's not a critique of anyone's administration. Um, that's more a critique of our cultures of higher education, where we don't have a lot of time to process things. So for those of you who have been to the State Board, you know that I have a little cubicle. Um, I call it my ivory cubicle. And I don't teach classes and I don't have any direct reports. And I only work with faculty and people who are really uh, passionate about professional development. So I have a lot of time to sift through literature and then think about how to message it. And so I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. And um, and I also have access to conversations at the State Board with really, really smart and amazing people. Um, our Director of Research, Darby Kaikinen, um, has really created a robust infrastructure of data um, and evidence that I have access to. And um, so I, again, like, I, one of my challenges in this role is to figure out how to make sure that after I learn something that I effectively share it with other people. Um, because I, I believe in this work. Um, I, I believe, I believe in guided pathways and um, one of my colleagues was asking me, um, you know, like, do you have any hesitations about guided pathways? And I don't actually, because I believe in what happened. I, I believe in the power of a collective attention. And I think that there is something really magical that has never happened before in my entire time in the Washington State CTC system, where our entire focus is around how do we reorganize our systems, our policies, our structures to remove equity gaps so that more students 
get to their goals. And how do we do that with a with an with an equity lens? Um, it's very exciting work, and I get to do it with really beautiful people like you. So, thank you for coming today. Um, thank you so much to all of you for making the time to uh, to be with me. I hope that this has whet your appetite for the second webinar on metacognitive skills, concepts, and habits of mind. Um, I'd like to do. There, there's a lot more to talk about, um, which is why I'm glad we have more webinars. And um, and I also want to say thank you for your patience with me. Um, I, I've spent a lot of time working on this slide deck, and I was like, is this the right content? And I was telling some people uh, before we started the webinar that I um, last night when I went to bed, I had the slide deck kind of finished, and I was like, it's all wrong, it's all wrong. So I woke up this morning and like just went back at it again. So. Thanks for the privilege of getting to share this information with all of you. Um, if there are no other questions or comments, I'm going to stop the recording. Okay.